from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome to the Library of Congress. My name is Rob Casper. I'm the head of the Poetry and Literature Center here, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the presentation of the 2014 Rebecca Johnson Bobbitt National Prize for Poetry. Those of you who are hoping to attend this uh, event in February, thank you for coming again. The weather did not cooperate on February 17th, as you may recall, and it definitely seems to be in a different stage of um, the spring that's where we manage now. Uh, before I begin, let me remind you to do what I'm going to do, which is to turn off your cell phones and any other electronic devices that you have that might interfere with the recording of this event. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the Poetry and Literature Center. We are home to the Poet Laureate Center on Poetry, and we present programs such as these. Throughout the year, uh, we have uh, materials out in the front uh, if you're interested in a sign-up sheet, uh, you can sign up to uh, get uh, emails about our upcoming events. Uh, we have an amazing event at the end of April, uh, the Poet Laureate final event featuring two Poets Laureate, uh, our current Poet Laureate, Charles Wright, and the 15th Poet Laureate Consultant of Poetry, Charles Simic, in a moderated discussion with uh, poetry editor, Poetry Magazine editor Don Cher. So it's a once-in-a-lifetime event uh, like this one, and I hope you'll be there too. Let me tell you also a little bit about the Bobbitt Prize. The Bobbitt Prize recognizes the most distinguished book of poetry by an American published during the preceding two years or for lifetime achievement of an American poet. We are indebted to the jurors who read through almost 100 submissions this past fall. Betty Sue Flowers, former director of the Lyndon Baines Johnson Library and Museum and emeritus professor of English at the University of Texas at Austin is here with us tonight. Betty Sue, if you could please stand. We can all give her a hand. I would also like to acknowledge our two other judges for the 2014 prize. Camille Dungy, professor of English at Colorado State University, and Mark Jarman, centennial professor of English and associate chair of the English department at Vanderbilt University. My thanks to all three jurors for their work selecting the winning book and for being a great trio to deal with. I would also like to acknowledge the publisher of this year's winner, Coffee House Press. The first time the press, celebrating its 30th year, has published a Bobbitt Prize winning collection. Finally, I would like to thank Philip Bobbitt for his generous gift that makes the prize possible. Dr. Bobbitt is the A.W. Walker Centennial Chair in the School of Law at the University of Texas, Austin and an author of several books on constitutional law, international security, and the history of strategy, including Terror and Consent, The Wars for the 21st Century, and The Shield of Achilles. Please welcome Dr. Bobbitt to the podium to give a few remarks about the origins of the prize. have to update that bio. I'm no longer uh, a chairholder of the University of Texas. I'm now the lowest of the low. I'm, a, I'm an untendered lecturer. 25 years ago, uh, my father and I and the Billingtons, uh, Jim and Marjorie, uh, came together at the Library of Congress to honor the first recipient of the Rebecca Johnson Bobbitt National Prize for Poetry. 25 years. A quarter of a century has passed so eventfully that even the prize nights themselves, to which I so much look forward, are blurred with the happenings of the years. 20 years ago, my father died. 15 years ago, a new millennium began. 10 years ago, I largely left Texas and took up a new post on the East Coast. In the last five years, I married we had two children, we began worrying about schools. And every two years, there was a punctuation here at the library, a pause in the din of life as we gathered to honor Merrill, 
Flick, Strand, Ammons, Coke, Bedard, Ferry, Fulton, Fairchild, Merwin, Wright, Hickok, Carrillo, and Stern. What a list. Robert Pinsky, our three-time poet laureate, proclaimed that, and I quote, no other literary prize has set such a high standard, unquote. And this year's winner, Patricia Smith, rightly joins this remarkable group. It has been my pleasure these last two decades to say something at these gatherings about my family and especially about my mother in whose honor this prize was presented. Becky Johnson of Johnson City, where she was when she met my father here at the Library of Congress in the 1930s. My parents' story is a Washington story. Here they fell in love during the Depression. Here they reluctantly left when the war began. My mother really didn't want to leave Washington. One of her suitors had bribed the orchestra leader at the Shoreham to play the Yellow Rose of Texas whenever she came to the ballroom, and she wasn't going to get that kind of treatment back in Austin. She had escaped Texas, and I think she probably didn't want to marry a man from Texas. But they eloped to Mexico. They lived together mainly in Texas for almost 40 years. When she died, I found a cache of some unusual index cards in a pigeonhole in her small green writing desk. Each card had a hole drilled in the center of the top line, and on each was typed poetry or a lofty saying. I took them to my father, and I said, uh, what are all these cards? Well, he said, you remember that I met your mother at the Library of Congress, where we were both working our way through school. My father had won a scholarship to come east to college from Texas. My mother was studying library science, as it was called then. Father said to me, you know that your mother was engaged to another man when I married. And I said, oh, yeah, I sort of remember that. Princeton graduate, in fact. Well, I had to dislodge this fellow, but the only time I saw your mother was at work, and we had a very strict supervisor. We worked in cataloging. Those cards are from the card catalog, which explain the holes, which were not, in fact, at the top, but at the bottom. And we would exchange notes as if we were typing reference information. Well, ever since then, I've had a real affection for libraries. My father and I sat and we talked, and out of that conversation came the idea of the Poetry Prize here at the library. But I want to uh, depart from my notes just a second and say, that that wasn't enough. No, that wasn't nearly enough. Without Jim Billington, without his sustained, imaginative, and I think quite courageous leadership these 25 years, none of these prizes would ever have happened. In these 25 years, we've had 13 of these prize ceremonies. For some persons, 13 is an unlucky number. My former apartment house in Manhattan, like many apartment houses, doesn't have a 13th floor. In Finland, a consortium led by the Ministry of Social Affairs and Health promotes National Accident Day, which always falls on the 13th day of the month. <laughs> the fear of the number 13 is called triskaidekaphobia, but the origin of this fear is obscure. In Greece, the 13th was dreaded, perhaps because the fall of Constantinople occurred on the 13th, uh, whose anniversary will come in a week, by the way. Yet I've always found 13s rather lucky. When I was 13, I was a sophomore in high school. He'd just gotten his braces off and had his first exciting kiss. <laughs> 13 years later, I was graduating from law school. The photographs of my parents, who had come to New Haven for the ceremony, disclosed that they had put on very confident faces to hide their relief and astonishment. I suppose my parents' marriage was the usual combination of opposites. My mother was gregarious, but willful, witty, frank, and spontaneous. My father was reticent, but he loved to laugh. He was diplomatic, but he was cautious. My mother took it for granted that everyone loved her, though in fact some didn't. My father assumed that no one outside his family loved him, although everyone did. A popular Broadway play at the time, which they took me to see when I was a boy, 
provide the punchline for his commentary on his wife, he would say, that's our Auntie May, admiringly. And I would admit there were some similarities. And like most successful combinations of opposites, theirs rested on practically identical views of the basics. The primacy of family, self-respect, integrity, the duty to be of service to those less favored, admiration for talent and struggle, trust in each other, taking the burdens of your choices and feelings and spending the rest of your life living up to them, and above all, protecting the object of your love. My mother was a dazzler. One of her friends wrote that Becky's coming into a room is like opening a bottle of champagne. And my father wanted to be dazzling. If she was the ballerina in the pas de deux who was held aloft, my father was content to be the danseur, lifting, holding, steadying. But the trouble with any human alliance, however strong its bonds, is its transience. When my mother married, she was a young professional, supporting herself, keeping a budget. My father was a fraternity man with a set of white tie tails. But as the years passed, my father ceded to her the social whirlwind at which she resulted, at which she excelled, and she forgot how to balance a checkbook. So that when my father was finally left alone, he was a bit unbalanced. He had come to depend on her and she on him in the way a chair depends on its legs, unconscious, incompatible with any severability. I was born when you kissed me. I died when you left me. I lived the years while you loved me. My father was a handsome man, much younger when my mother died than I am now. And he was pursued by many a widow and divorcee. But the relationships didn't last, and he told me that he thought he was being unfaithful. When Joseph Holmes' wife, Fanny, died, he said, for 60 years she made my life poetry. Perhaps tonight, as we come here to honor poetry, and this marvelous poet, Patricia Smith, we might pause and regard the invisible laws the ones that accrue to someone who makes the perishable prose of marriage and family into a kind of imperishable poetry. Thank you. Thank you, Philip, for reminding us why we are here tonight, honoring poetry and your family. And I would like to say, you'll always be the chair of prizes here in the Poetry and Literature Center at the Library of Congress, no matter what the University of Texas calls you. Uh, I am pleased to present all of you tonight with the 2014 Rebecca Johnson Bobbitt National Prize for Poetry winner, Patricia Smith. Um, as Mr. Bobbitt stated, uh, she joins a long and distinguished list of uh, recipients as the, fifth, as the 13th. Um, I just want to note that uh, four of the Poets Laureate have received uh, this honor as well. Our current Poet Laureate, Charles Wright, as well as W.S. Merwin, Louise Glick, and Mark Strand. Uh, about this year's prize winner, uh, Judge Mark Jarman wrote uh, a, wonderful, a wonderful citation. Quote, Patricia Smith's Should Have Been Jimmy Savannah is a tour de force of the possibilities of contemporary poetry, echoing as it does the verse tradition of Gwendolyn Brooks and the jazzy colloquial attitudes of Langston Hughes. The vital spoken word scene of Chicago is ever present as the poet narrates the rich tragicomic experiences of family life from childhood to adulthood. These, there are prose poems and rhyming tercets, dramatic monologues and anecdotes of sexual awakening, portraits of the obscure and the infamous, biting satires of popular culture and tender love songs and elegies for the great artists of rhythm and blues. The glory of Should Have Been Jimmy Savannah is that so many identities are included and celebrated. In style and in substance, it's a book that contains multitudes. We are thrilled to have Patricia Smith here tonight to honor her work. Please join me in welcoming her. Uh, 
How's everyone doing? I would like to uh, offer heartfelt thanks to everyone who had a role in bringing me to this moment. A little uh, colored girl from the west side of Chicago whose mother told her that she could not be a writer because only white men did that. And, uh, and my father, I was very happy to hear Mr. Baba talk about family. My father, who brought with him from Arkansas something I like to call the tradition of the back porch and taught me to look at the world in terms of the stories it could tell early on. And I knew exactly what it is I wanted to do. I knew that words could make a magic that I couldn't make otherwise. Um, I wanted to start this reading with a poem that's actually not in this book but it's a poem that reminds me of the power that words have to move us from one place in our head to a safer place. And one of the first places that I traveled to as a poet was um, Miami, Florida. I was sent to work with a group of sixth graders. And the area that I had gone to had a high incidence of uh, drug abuse. So there were a lot of kids and who had lost parents and siblings to AIDS. And there was a little girl there whose mother had just died, and she asked me to help her write a poem about her mother. So I do this uh, because I think of all the children who are waiting for someone to come into a classroom and tell them that this is an option available for them, uh, something that they could use to tell their own stories. So I'm going to do a poem that's dedicated to the sixth grade class at Lily C. Evans Elementary School in Dade County, Miami, which they've made me promise to say every time <laughs> do the poem. I am astonished at their mouthful names. Lacanicia, Chevalane, Galeo, Fumaleo. Their ragged rebellions and lip gloss pouts and all those pants drooped as drapery. I rejoice when they kiss my face, whisper wet and urgent in my ear, make me their obsession because I have brought them poetry. They shout me raw, bruise my wrist with their pulling, and brashly claim me as mama as they cradle my head in their little laps, waiting for new words to grow in my mouth. You, you, you. Angry, jubilant, weeping poets, we are all saviors, reluctant hosannas in the limelight, but you knew that, didn't you? So let us bless this sixth grade class. Forty cracking voices, forty nappy heads, and all of them raise their hands when I ask. They have all seen the reaper, grim in his heavy robe, pushing the button for the dead project elevator, begging for a break at the corner pawn shop, cackling wildly in the back pew of the Baptist church. I ask the death question, and 40 fists punch the air. Me! Me, an O'Neill matchstick crack child, watched his mother's body become a claw. And nine-year-old Tico Jefferson, barely big enough to lift the gun, fired a bullet into his throat when Mama bended his back with a lead pipe. Tamika cried into a sofa pillow when Daddy blasted Mama into the north wall of their cluttered one-room apartment. Danya's cousin, gone in a drive-by, dark window, Click, 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 gone, says Danya, her tiny finger a barrel, the thumb a hammer. I am astonished at their losses. And yet when I read a poem about my own hard-eyed teenager, Jeffrey asks, is he dead yet? It cannot be comprehended. My 18-year-old still pushing and pulling his own breath. And 40 faces pity me, knowing that I will soon be as they are, numb to our bloodied histories, favoring the reaper with a thumbs up and a wink, hearing the question and shouting, me, me, Miss Smith, I know somebody dead. Can poetry hurt us, they ask me, before crawling into my words to sleep? I love you, Nicole says. Nicole wearing my face, pimples peppering her nose, and she is as black as angels are. Nicole's braids kissed with match flame to seal them. And, and can you teach me to write a poem about my mama, Miss Smith? I mean, you write about your daddy, and he's dead. Can you teach me to remember my mama? 
A teacher tells me this is the first time Nicole has admitted that her mother is gone. Murdered by slim silver needles and a stranger rifling through her blood, the virus pushing her skeleton through for Nicole to see. And now this child with rusty knees and mismatched shoes sees poetry as her screen and asks me for the words to build her mother again, replacing the voice, stitching on the lost flesh. So poets, as we take the stage, as we flirt and sin and rejoice behind microphones, remember Nicole. She knows that we are here now and she is an empty vessel waiting to be filled. And she is waiting. And she is waiting. And she waits. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jimmy Savannah, this book started out, I started out to write a book about Motown. I love Motown. And uh, I wanted to find out, you know, why this music had such sway over me when I was growing up. And as I was gathering this, I thought I'd write about some Motown artists, I'll write about some Motown songs. Uh, and I realized that what I was really writing about was being first generation up north. I was writing about my parents coming up from the south and what it was like to kind of establish that life in a city when they didn't have any history in a city. Uh, so it's roughly chronological. There's some things in here about my folks. I want to read the title poem. My uh, mother told me, I was an adult, and she said, you'll never guess what your father wanted to name you. And I said, what? She said, Jimmy Savannah. And I said, and you, of course, went for the incredibly functional Patricia Ann. Uh, Jimmy said, wouldn't that have been a cool poet name? Jim, here comes Jimmy Savannah, like Cher or something, you know? Uh, so this is that story. My mother scraped the name Patricia Ann from the ruins of her discarded delta, thinking it would offer me shield and shelter that leering men would skulk away at the slap of it. Her hands on the hips of Alabama, she went for flat and functional, then siphoned each syllable of drama, repeatedly crushing it with her broad, practical tongue until it sounded like an instruction to God and not a name. She wanted a child of pressed head and knocking knees, a trip up in the double dutch swing, a starch pinafore and peppermint in the sour pickle kind of child, stiff laced and unshakably fixed on salvation. Her Patricia Ann would never idly throat the Lord's name or wear one of those thin, sparkled skirts that flirted with her knees. She'd be a nurse or a third grade teacher or postal drone, jobs requiring alarm clock discipline and sensible shoes. My four downbeats were music enough for a vapid life of butcher shop sawdust and fat back as cuisine, for raids spritzed into the writhing pockets of a Murphy bed. No crinkled consonants or muted hiss would summon me. My daddy detested borders. One look at my mother's watery belly, and he insisted as much as he could insist with her on the name Jimmy Savannah, seeking to bless me with the blues bathed moniker of a ball breaker, the name of a grown gal in a snug red dress and unlaced all stop. He wanted to shoot muscle through whatever I was called, arm each syllable with tiny weapons so no one would, would mistake me for anything other than a tricky whisperer with a switchblade in my shoe. I was bound to be all legs, a bladed debutante hooked on lucky strikes and sugar. When I sent up prayers, God's boy would giggle and consider. Daddy didn't want me to be anybody's surefire factory, nobody's call back or seized rhythm, so he conjured a name so odd and hot even a boy could claim it. And yes, he was prepared for the look my mother gave him when he first mouthed his choice, the look that said, that's it, you done lost your damn mind. <laughs> she did that thing she does where she grows two full inches with righteous, and he decided to just whisper, Love you, Jimmy Savannah, whenever we were alone, re and rechristening me the seed of Otis, conjuring his own religion and naming it me. Thank you very much. Thank you.
And we've already been talking about the lucky number 13. Um, I have a class of writers who will not write about anything, so I have to kind of trick them into it. And uh, one day it was finals day, and I said, okay, great, no final. And they said, yay, they carried me around the room on their shoulders, yay. And I said, instead, this is what I want you to do. I want you to, I asked them what their most difficult age was, and the consensus was 13. And when you th I want you to all think about 13 for a second. Miserable, right? So if you have skin when you were 13, something was wrong with it, right? So there's all this stuff going on. And so I said, okay, I want you to write a poem about being 13. I want it to be 13 stanzas, 13 lines each stanza, 13 syllables each line. Don't you wish you were in my class? Uh, <laughs> and of course, when I give them something to do, I do it too. So of course, their 13 and my 13 were totally different. But I'm going to read, uh, I'm not going to read all 13 of these. I'm going to pick and choose a couple of them. Ready? Just think about 13. Put yourself back in that mindset. Okay, good. Uh, I'll start with two. Right now, this Tuesday in July, nothing's headier than the words sheen, manageable, bounce. Squinting into the smeared mirror, you search your head for them. You probe with greased fingers, spreading paths in the chaos, wide enough for the advertised glimmer to escape, but your snarls hold tight to their woven dry confounding. Fevered strands snap under the drag of the wiry brush, and order unfurls, while down the hall your mama rotates the hot comb in a bleary blaze and smacks her joyful gum. Still, TV bellows its promise. You witness the pink snap of the perfect neck, hear the impossible vow. Shampoo with this, sheen, bounce. Her corn silk head is gospel, it's so true. Come here, child. Even your mama's calling you, Burns. Three. Miss Stein scribbled a word on the blackboard, said, who can pronounce this? And the word was anemone. And from that moment, you first felt the clutter of possible in your mouth. From the time you stumbled through the rhythm and she slow smiled, you suddenly knew you had the right to be explosive, to sling syllables through back doors, to make up your own words just when you needed them. All that day, sweet anemone tangled in your teeth spurted sugar tongue, led you to the dictionary where you were assured that it still existed, to the cave of the bathroom where you warbled it in bounce echo, and finally, convinced you own that teeny gospel, you wrote it again and again and again and a four. Trying hard to turn hips to slivers, sway to stutter, you walk past the Sinclair station where lanky boys, dust in their hair, dressed in their uniform forms of oil and thud, rename you victim with their eyes. They bring sound, shudder, and blue from their throats just for you, serve up ancient sonata of skin drum and conch shell, sing suggesting woos of AM radio, Boom, boom, how you just gonna walk on by like that? And suddenly you know why you are stitched so tight, crammed like a flash bomb into pinafore, obeying your mama's instructions to be a baby as long as you can. Because it's a man's world, and James Brown is gasoline, the other side of slow zippers. He is all of it, the pump, pump, the growled, please, please, please. Eight. In the bathroom of the whatnot joint on the way to school, you get rid of the starched and billowed lace, barrettes taming unraveling braids, white knee socks, and sensible hues. From a plastic bag, you take out electric blue eyeshadow, platforms with silver glittered heels, neon fishnets, and a blouse that doesn't so much button as suggest shut. The transformation takes five minutes, and you emerge feeling like a budding lady, but looking, in retrospect, like a blind streetwalker bursting from a cocoon. <laughs> this is what television does. Turns your mother into clueless backdrop, fills your pressed head with the probability of thrum. Your body becomes just not yours anymore. It's a dumb little marquee. Nine. With your bed, this one's painful for me. With your bedroom door closed, you are skyscraper bouffant, peach foundation and eyelashes like upturned claws. You are exuding ice. You are pinched all over by earrings. You are way too much woman for this room. 
The audience has one chest, a single shared chance to gasp. They shudder, heave, waiting for you to open your mouth and break their hearts. Taking the stage, you become an S, pour eight into hip swings, tisk tisk as the front row collapses. Ooh, they want you. You lift the microphone, something illegal comes out of you. Mama flings the door open with a church version of your name. Then you are pimpled, sexless, ashed, and double Dutch knees. You are spindles. You are singing into a hairbrush. I know, somebody, somebody's like, ugh. I used to put my father's like white shirt on my head and that the, the sleeves would hang down here and you could not tell me I didn't have long white pigtails. I was like, ugh. It's a blonde girl, you know. 13, you're almost 14 and you think you're ready to push beyond the brutal wisdoms of the one and the three, but some nagging craze in you doesn't want to let go. You suspect that you will never be this unfinished, all Hail Mary and precipice, stuttering sachet, fuses in your swollen chest suddenly lit and spitting, and you'll need to give your hips a name for what they did while you weren't there. You'll miss the pervasive fever that signals blooming, the sore lessons of jump rope in your calves. This is the last year your father is allowed to touch you. Sighing, you push Barbie's perfect body through the thick dust of a top shelf. There, her prideful heart thunders. She has heartened you well. She has taught you. And, and why I don't have these all arranged already is because I like to look in the eyes of the audience and kind of figure out what you'd like to hear. And of course, now I have no idea. <laughs> all right. Oh, no, that's not, not that. Oh, okay. So cutting through my neighborhood was Madison Street. And um, it was where all the commerce was. And then after... The King assassination, the whole, my whole neighborhood was burned down. It wasn't built back for years and years. So I wanted to try and recreate a ride on the Madison Street bus that sliced all the way through my neighborhood and went straight into downtown Chicago um, and at that time before the riots. So this is called Tavern, Tavern, Church, Shuttered Tavern. Then Goldblatt's with its finger-smeared display window full of stifled plaid pinafore and hard-tailored serge, each unattainable thread cooing the delayed lusciousness of layaway. Another church then, of course, Jesus on every other block, then the butcher shop with, hard to believe, the blanched archaic head of a hog propped upright to lure waffling patrons into the steamy innards of yet another storefront where they drag their feet through sawdust and revel in the come-hither bouquet of blood. Then a vacant lot, then another vacant lot, right up against a shoe store, specializing in unyielding leather, all stars and glittered stacked heels designed for the Christian woman daring the jute box. Then the whatnot joint, with vanilla ice long johns, wax lips crammed with sugar water, notebook paper, swollen sour pickles buoyant in a splintered barrel, school supplies, pixie sticks, licorice whips, and vaguely warped 45s by Fontella Bass or Johnny Taylor. Now, ooh, what's that blue pepper? Piercing the air with the nouns of backwood and cheap delta cuts, neck and gizzard, skin and claw. It's the chicken shack, wobbling on a foundation of board, greased riding relentless on three of its walls. The slick cuisine served up in virgin white cardboard boxes with Tabasco nibbling the seams, scorched wings under soaked slices of Wonder Bread, blind perch fried limp, spice like it's a mistake Mississippi done made, and Speaking of, July moans around a perfect perfume tangle of eight Baptist gals on the corner of Kedzie and Warren, fanning themselves with their own impending funerals. Fluid-filled ankles like tree trunks sprouting from narrow slingbacks, choking in Sears' best cinnamon-tinged hoes, their legs so unlike their arms and faces. On the other side of the street is everything they are trying to be beyond, everything they are trying to ignore. The great promise of government, 25 floors of lined windows, of peeling grates called balconies, of yellow panties and shredded diapers fluttering from open windows. 
of them nasty gals with wide avenue hips stomping double dutch in the concrete courtyard spewing their woman verses too fueled and irreversible to be not listened to and wiggled against and the madison street bus revs its tired engine backs up a little for traction and drives smoothly into the sweaty space between their legs which is the only route out of the day that we are riding through <laughs> I was on the bus again, though. Okay, let me do this. Okay. <sighs> Hip hop puzzle. It's a Persian form. See, it's G H A Z A L. People say gazel, puzzle, gazal, and I go, puzzle, <coughs> puzzle. Right? That's okay. Anyway, so I got to say it one more time now. Hip hop hustle. All right now. Gotta love us brown girls, munching on fat, swinging blue hips, decked out in shells and splashes. Lord, bringing them woo hips. As the jukebox teases, watch my sisters throat the heartbreak, inhaling bass line, cracking backbone, and singing through hips. Like something boneless, we glide silent, seeping between floorboards, wrapping around the hymns, and ooh-wee, clinging like glue hips. Engines grinding, rotating, smoking, gotta pull back some. Natural minds are lost at the mere sight of swinging true hips. Gotta love us girls, just strutting down Chicago streets, killing the men folk with a dose of that stinging view. Hips. Crying about getting old, Patricia, you need to get up off what God gave you. Say a prayer and start slinging. Cue, hips. <laughs> oh, God, I'm on, I'm on stage at the Bobbitt Prize reading about my hips. <laughs> Who knew? Uh, once again, my students, I, I try to surprise them with different forms. So we were looking at limericks one day, and of course, they were coming with all the dirtiest limericks they could find. And I said, would it be great if we could just stop thinking of this as a small, like little funny form and, and do something else with it? So these are limericks kind of strung together to make a single poem, and they're not about anything funny. They're basically about um, my extreme love for Smokey Robinson and how my childhood was pretty much guided by whatever Smokey told me I should do. That's why I'm still waiting for him to ride up like naked on a white horse or something. Ooh, baby, baby. <laughs> there once was a song that took hold of a child, because the tale that it told made her feel flushed and held, until she was compelled to play it again, to behold the craving encased in each note that slipped from the singer's sleek throat, because the beg that he sighed made her ache from inside. She was moved by his words to devote her tomorrows to all that he said. She was told she was out of her head. But his tenor dug deep, interrupting her sleep, so she did some wild dreaming. Instead of singing it dizzy, she would pretend that he loved her, or could. In her mirror, she braced for his kiss and the taste of his mouth. Every day there she stood in a room by herself, all alone, with a body no longer her own. All her soul was engrossed in no more than a ghost, every moment a new stepping stone, toward an empty she didn't dare to name, knowing Smokey was never to blame. Though she whispered no fair as she slow danced with air, her hip-heavy waltzing a shame. But if the song made her prefer the conjure, the hot him and her, she would live in her head, stunned in love, newly wed, the real just a feverish blur. So she drowned in the silk of his voice just because there was never a choice. She was helplessly shook by his ooh-la-la -la hook. Not a thing left to do but rejoice in a romance that really was none and a two that was really just one. She was fatally awed by a falsetto god his wooing had left her undone. There once was a song that took hold of a child because the story it told made her feel flushed and held until she was compelled to give in to the lies that it told. Okay. I'm sorry, I have to do that every time. All right, uh, what time did I start reading, Mr. MC type person? Okay, I'm, I'm going to be careful. All right, I will be careful. All right, let's see. I like that. Uh, all right, 
I will read, um, I am really kind of matching up these things to you guys. All right. Well, don't you hate when readers do this? When they start, like, okay. A colored girl will slice you if you talk wrong about Motown. The men and women who coupled, causing us, first arrived confounded. Surrounded by teetering towers of no, not now, and you should have known better, they cowered and built little boxes of northern home, crammed themselves inside, feasted on the familiar of fat skin and the unskimmed, made God of doors. When we came, the same insistent bloody and question we would have been down south, they clutched us, plumped us on government cereal drenched in carnation milk, slathered our hair, faces, and fat wiggling arms and legs with Vaseline. We shined like the new things we were. The city squared its teeth, smiled oil, smelled the sour each hour left at the corner of our mouths. Our parents threw darts at the day. They romanced shut factories, waged hot battle with skittering roaches and vermin, lumbered after hunches. Their newborn children grew like streetlights. We grew like insurance payments. We grew like resentment. And since no tall sweet gum thrived to offer its shouldered shade, no front porch lesson spun wide to craft our wrong or righteous, our parents loosed us into the crumble, into the glass, into the hips of a new city. They trusted exploded summer hydrants, scarlet licorice whips, and crumbling rocks of government cheese to conjure a sort of joy, trusted joy to school us in the woeful limits of jukeboxes and moonwash. Freshly dunked in church water, slapped away from double negatives and country ways, we were orphans of the North Star, dutifully sacrificed, our young bodies arranged on sharp slabs of boulevard. We learned what we needed, not from our parents and their rumored South, but from the gospel seeping through the sad gap in Mary Wells' grin. Smoky, slow-sketched pictures of our husbands, their future skins flooded with white light, their voices all remorse and atmospheric coo. Little Stevie squeezed his eyes shut on the soul notes, replacing his dark with ours. Diana was the bone our mamas coveted, the flow of slip silver that they knew was buried deep beneath their rollicking heft. Every lyric, growled or sweet from perfect brown throats, was instruction. Sit pert, pout, and seam silk, then watch him beg. Every spun line was consolation. You're such a good girl. If he has not arrived, he will. Every wall of horn, every slick choreographed swivel threaded us with the rhythm of the mildly wild. We slept with transistor radios, worked the two silver knobs, one tiny earbud blocking out the roar of our parents' tardy attempts to retrieve us. Instead, we snuggled with the temps, lined up five pretty men across, and damned if they didn't begin every one of their songs with the same words, girl. Thank you. Okay. All right, I'm going to do um, two more poems. One, um, about my mom, actually one about my mom, one about my dad, and then the last one. I think we're doing okay time-wise? Okay. How Mamas Begin Sometime, for my mother, Annie Pearl Smith. Raging Tom girl, blood dirt streaking her thick ankles and bare feet, she is always running, screech raucous, careening, dare and games in her clothesline throat. Plain like she has to play to live, she shoves at what slows her, steamrolls whatever damn thing won't move. Aliceville, Alabama is no fool, it won't get in her way. Where's that girl going? Past slant sag porches, pea shuck, twangy box guitars begging under purple day fall. Comb spitting sparks, hair parted and scalp scratched, mules trembling the back road, the marble stairs of elders fixed on checkerboards. 
Cursed futures crammed into cotton pouches with pinches of bitter root, the horrid parts of meat stewed sweet and possible. And still, whispers about the disappeared, whole souls lost in the passage. Frolicking blindly, flailing tough with cousins, sisters, but running blaze, running on purpose, bounding toward a way. She can't tag this fever, but she believes it knows her, owns her in a way religion should. Toes tap, feet flatten out inside the sin of shoes. She is most times asking something, steady asking, needing to know, needing to know now, taking wing on that blue restless that drums her. Twisting on rusty hinge, that old porch door whines for one long second about where she was. But that girl, gone. And daddy. Okay. Uh, my, you know how the, you have these stories that are passed down through families and they're passed down so much that you really don't know what's true, what's not. I knew my father's parents, my father had lost his parents in a, a car accident. They both died. And there was this story that was passed down, and I was like, that can't be true. And then finally I found out that it was indeed. So um, this is called Still Life with Tupic. Maybe his father grunted, brusque and focused as he brawled with the steering. Maybe there was enough time for a flashed invective, some hot-patched dalliance with God. Then the Plymouth, sounding like a cheated-on woman, screamed into hurdled revolt and cracked against a tree. Bone rammed through shoulders, functions imploded, compounded pulse spat slow thread into the road. His small stuttering mother's body braided up sloppy with foliage and windshield. His daddy became the noon's smeared smile. For hours, they simply rained. It is Arkansas, so the sky was a cerulean stretch, the sun a patient wound. The boxy sedan smoldered and spat along the blistered curve while hounds and the skittering sniffed the lumping red river and blood birds sliced lazy over the wreck, patiently waiting for the feast to cool. The sheriff sidled up, finally, rolled a toothpick across his bottom teeth and weighed his options. It was round lunchtime, the meatloaf on special, that slinky waitress on call. He climbed back into his cruiser and drove off, his mind clear. Awfully nice of these poor niggers to help out. Damned if they didn't just drip right into the dirt. Pretty much buried themselves. Okay, so do I have like eight minutes or should I stop? Okay, so this 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 is um this is the Motown piece. This is a crown of sonnets. Um and each sonnet, the last line of the sonnet will become the first line of the sonnet after it all the way through. And the last sonnet is composed of the first lines of all the sonnets. Okay, got it? Anyway, it's in here somewhere. Okay, and this is about Motown. This is kind of about looking at Motown from an adult perspective, and you realize how much it was smoke and mirrors and how all your ideas about life or love and romance were pretty much defined by whatever Motown song was out at the time. And, and men in Motown were always begging. So I grew up thinking I was just born to be begged for. You know, it's just like, I'm just waiting, like, what, what, what? You know, they were always on their knees. They were always begging. They always wanted things to be like they were, you know, and you, and you just sat there and just waited. There was a, a line, you know, a begging line, just, okay, next, next. Okay. <laughs> Motown Crown. The temps all swerve and pivot, conjured schemes that had us skip in school, made us forget how mama schooled us hard against the threat of five-part harmony and shark skin seams. We spent our school days balanced on the beams of moon we wished upon, the needle jet black 45s that spun and hadn't yet become the dizzy spinning of our dreams. Sugar pie, honey bunch. Oh, you loved our tangled hair and rusty knees. Marvin Gaye slowed down while we gave chase, then wowed us with his skinny hips on cue. We hungered for the angriest 
anguished screech of pleas from soulful throats, relentless and booming bass. From soulful throats, relentless booming bass softened with the turn of Smokey's key. His languid, liquid, luscious, aching plea for bodies we didn't have yet made a case for lying to ourselves. He would embrace our naps and raging pimples. We could see his croon inside our clothes. His pedigree of milky, flawless skin meant we'd replace our daddies with his fat and lanky frame. I did you wrong, my heart went out to play. He serenaded, filling up the space that separated smoke from certain flame. Couldn't comprehend the drug of him, his sway, silk where his throat should be. He growled such grace. Silk where his throat should be and growling grace, little Stevie made us wonder why we even needed sight. His rhythm eye could see us click our hips and pump in place whenever he cut loose. Ooh, we'd unlace our Converse All-Stars. Yeah, we wondered why we couldn't get down without our shoes. We tried to dance and keep up with his funky pace of hiss and howl and hum, and then he'd slow to twist our hearts until he heard them crack, ignoring lonesome leaking from the seams. The rocking blind boy couldn't help but show us light. We wailed his every soulful track through open windows and neath the door, pipe dreams. Through open windows, neath the door, pipe dreams served up bone bouffant, the serpentine and bug-eyed Lady D, the boisterous queen of overdone, her body built from beams of awkward light. Her slithering extremes just made us feel so small. Insanely lean, everywhere she stepped, she caused a scene. We craved her wigs and waist and crafted schemes that would ensure our hips would soon be thin, that we'd hear symphonies, wouldn't hurry, love, because Diana said, make sure it gleams no matter what it is. Her different spin, a voice like sugar air, no inkling of a soul beneath the vinyl, the Supremes. That soul beneath the vinyl, the Supremes knew nothing of it. They were breathy sighs and flowing hips, soul music's booby prize. But Mary Wells, so drained of self-esteem, was a pudgy barstool riding buck tooth dream who none of us would dare to idolize out loud. She had our nightmares memorized, and like or like it not, she wailed our theme while her two blackness made us ill at ease and we smeared Artra on to reach for white. When Mary's My Guy blared, we didn't think race, because there was all that romance and the keys that Motown held. Unlocked, we'd soon ignite. We stockpiled extra sequins just in case. We stockpiled extra sequins just in case the Marvelettes pronounced we'd benefit from little dabs of shine. If we could get inside their swirl, a kind of naughty place, we knew that all the boys would have to brace themselves against our heat, much too legit to dress up as some other thing. We split our blue jeans trying to match their pace. And soon, our breasts began to pop. We spoke in bluer tones, and Barry Gordy looked and licked his lips. Our only saving grace, the luscious, liquid, languid tone of smoke, the soundtrack while our A-cup bras unhooked, our sudden Negro hips, required more space. Our sudden Negro hips required more space, but we pretended not to feel that spill that changed the way we walked. And yes, we still felt nappy, awkward, strangely out of place while Motown crammed our eager hearts with lace and storylines. Romance was all uphill. No push, no prod, no bitter magic pill could lift us to its light. And not a trace of prizes they said we'd already won. As mamas called on Jesus, shook their heads, and mourned our Delta names, we didn't deem to care. Religion? There was only one. We took transistor preachers to our beds, and Smokey sang a lyric dripping cream. While Smokey sang a lyric dripping cream, Levi tried to woo us with his growl. I can't help myself, admit it with a scowl. This bit of weakness was a clever scheme to keep us screaming. Front row, under gleam of lights, beside the speaker's blasted vowels, we rocked and we streamed. Levi, on the prowl, glowed black, a savior in the stage light's beam. But then the stage light dimmed, and there we were, in bodies primed for what? We didn't know. We sang off key while skipping home alone. Deceptions that you sing to tend to blur and disappear in dance. Why is that so? Ask any colored girl and she will moan. Ask any colored girl and she will moan and answer with a downbeat and a sleek five-part croon. She's dazzled and she'll shriek what she's been taught. She won't long be alone or crazed with wanting more. One day she'll own that quiet heart that Motown taught to speak. She'll know that being the same makes her unique. She'll worship at the god of microphone until the bass line booms, until some old temptation leers and says, I'll take you home 
and heal you in the way the music vowed. She's mesmerized, his moves, his tooth is gold. She dances to the drumbeat of his poem, remembering how love had lied so loud. Remembering how love had lied so loud, we tangled in the rhythms that we chose. Seduced by thump and sequins, heaven knows we tried to live our hopeful lives unvowed, but bending led to break. We were so proud to mirror every lyric. Radios spit beg and mend, and sturdy stereos told us what we were and weren't allowed. Our daddies sweat in factories while we found other daddies under limelight's glow. Desperate, we begged them to illuminate the glitter lives they said they guarantee would save us. But instead, the crippling glow. We whimpered while the downbeat dangled bait. We whimpered while the downbeat dangled bait. We leapt and swallowed all the music said while Smokey laughed and Marvin fell and bled. Their sinning slapped us hard and slapped us straight. And even then, we listened for the great announcement of the drum, for tune to spread, a marvelette to pick up on the thread. But as we know by now, it's much too late to reconsider love or claw our way through all the glow they tossed to slow our roll. What we know now, we should have always known. When Smokey winked at us and whispered, they don't love you like I do, he snagged our soul. We wound up doing the slow drag all alone. They made us do the slow drag all alone. They made us kiss our mirrors, deal with heat and hips we couldn't control. They danced deceit, and we did too, addicted to the drone of revelation and the verses thrown our way. Oh, love will rock your world. The sweet, sweet fairy tale we spin will certainly beat the real thing any day. Oh, yes, we own you now. We sang you pliable and clueless, waiting, waiting. Oh, the dream you'll hug one day. The boy who l craves you right out loud in front of everyone. But we told you, we know we did. We preached it with a shrug. Less than perfect love was not allowed. Everybody okay? Almost done. Less than perfect love was not allowed. Temptations begged as if their every sway depended on you coming home to stay. Diana whispered air, aloof and proud, to be the perfect girl beneath a shroud of glitter and a fright she held at bay. And Michael Jackson flailing in the fray of daddy love succumbed to every crowd. What would we have done if not for them, wooing us with roses carved of sound and hiding muck we're born to navigate? Little did we know that they'd condemn us to live so tethered to the ground while every song they sang told us to wait. Every song they sang told us to wait, and wait we did, our gangly heartbeats stunned and holding place. Already so outgunned, we little girls obeyed, and now it's late, and CDs spinning just intimidate. The songs all say, just look at what you've done. You've wished through your whole life. And one by one, your trusting sisters realize they don't rate. So now, at 50 plus, I turn around and see the glitter drifting in my wake and mingling with the dirt. My dingy dreams are shoved high on the shelf. They're wrapped and bound so I can't see and contemplate that ache. The temps all swirl and pivot, conjured scheme. The temps all swirl and pivot, conjured schemes, from soulful throats, relentless booming bass, then silk where throats should be. Much growling grace, from open window, neath the door, pipe dreams, that soul beneath the vinyl. The Supremes used to stockpile extra sequins just in case Diana's Negro hips required more space, while Smokey penned a lyric, dripping cream. Ask any colored girl and she will moan, remembering how love had lied so loud. I whimpered while the downbeat dangled bait and taught myself to slow drag all alone. Less than perfect love was not allowed. And every song they sang told me to wait. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am so honored and so happy. <laughs> oh.
All right, I'll ask if uh, Mr. Bobbitt and uh, Betty Sue, you can come and join me up on the stage. We have one final thing to do. We've been waiting to do this uh, since uh, early February. Let me give you this. Uh, this is the opportunity. Why don't you stand over here? Where is uh, our photographer? Yes. There we go. Uh, we're now going to uh, uh, have Mr. Bobbitt, uh, Dr. Philip Bobbitt, uh, give you your uh, uh, prize, the Rebecca Johnson Bobbitt 2014 National Prize for Poetry. Congratulations, Patricia Smith. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.